So welcome everyone to this pl first plenary session in which we are honored to have Professor Ludger Besman as our keynote speaker. I suppose that most of you know him and even have read some of uh, his papers since he, he has been one of the leading figures in the field of economics of education over the last two decades. And when I was preparing this presentation, I had the opportunity to review his list of publications, and it's totally overwhelming, including many papers published in most prestigious uh, journals in the field of economics, which are also yeah, widely recognized and highly cited by researchers. As a result, uh, I have seen that he has more than 36,000 citations in, in Google Scholar. That's something that is very impressive, considering that he is very young. So uh, his main research interests are the determinants of uh, long-run prosperity and also determinants of student achievement and the importance of institutions uh, of the school uh, systems for efficiency and equity. He uh, frequently uses microeconometric uh, methods to, to address uh, these issues and, and, uh, and usually also uh, use data from international large scale uh, assessment. And he's also the co-editor of a very well-known handbook of uh, the economics of education. Uh, he's professor of economics at the University of Munich and director of the IFO Center uh, for the economics of education at, at the IFO uh, Institute. And he's also a distinguished uh, visiting fellow at the Hoover uh, Institution at the Stanford University. He's member of the International Academy of Education, fellow of the German uh, National Academy of Sciences Leopoldina and the Academic Advisory uh, Council of the German Federal Ministry of Economics. So his work has been recognized with multiple uh, international awards. So he's a very well recognized expert to, to speak today. And we are uh, extremely grateful that, that, uh, to you for accepting our invitation to be our keynote speaker today in this IDA meeting and also to maintain your commitment with the association uh, for an additional year after the cancellation of the of the previous meeting in, in 2020. So, uh, and I, in addition, I have the opportunity to read the working paper of the study that you are going to present, and it was very, very interesting. I'm sure that all the attendees uh, will enjoy your presentation. So as we talked uh, earlier, and we have, I don't know, uh, it would be uh, nice if you can speak for around 40 or 45 minutes, so we can have some time for, for questions uh, at the end. Uh, for all the people attending, uh, the questions, uh, you can either write them on the chat if you prefer or uh, 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 press the button, uh, the button, yeah, the raise your hand and I will let you, at the end of the presentation, I will let you um, inter um, interview and, um, and ask uh, uh, using your camera and, and your microphone. Okay, so Professor uh, Besman, the floor is yours. Thank you again. Thank you so much for the nice words, Jose. Yeah, for two years in a row, I was now looking forward to coming to Spain again, but uh, <laughs> not gonna happen. Um, but uh, at least the one thing we can do is actually meet uh, online and uh, at least discuss our work. So I won't have the chance to meet all of you, the ones who I don't know, I really wanted, wanted to get to know you, the ones I know to meet up again, okay? Not gonna have it, so I was at least thinking about which project to, to present here once, once I get the opportunity. And what I want to present here is something, yeah, that I think that, that I really like, and uh, I think is, is uh, also pretty important in terms of, uh, of the substance. And it's a project we've been working on for the past five, six years, really. Um, so it's joint work with uh, Sven Rasnjanski, Jens Rose, and Simon Wiederholt. Um, and it's about the question whether Mentoring uh, can help adolescents, so children uh, who are whatever, 14, 15 year old, uh, and who are really disadvantaged, come from uh, disadvantaged families. Um, so the background I think is pretty clear to most of you, uh, is that like really in all countries, we are kind of concerned that inequality can be very persistent uh, across generations. And if you wonder whether that's actually an issue for Germany as well, is a, yes, it is. Um, it's actually, even though we have a pretty extensive social welfare system, um, persistence across generations is actually relatively high, higher than, than in the uh, OECD average in Germany. Um, so if you think about it, about children from disadvantaged background, it's really like the characteristic that defines their state is that they 
uh, lack the usually pretty powerful family support that other children receive by what Jim Heckman has, has called the accident of birth. So in that sense, um, it's actually kind of not surprising that policies face pretty dire limitations because you cannot directly change this. Meaning you like schools cannot just go there and substitute the parents of, of a, like a disadvantaged child. They cannot change the parents either. And also if you even programs that directly target the families cannot substitute them and cannot fully change them. And so I guess what we all kind of think is the, the state of the art the stylized facts is that interventions that are successful in compensating this lack of family support usually uh, enter very early in life. Early childhood intervention programs uh, can really change the life track of, of disadvantaged children. At the same time, I think the received wisdom is that later interventions like late in school or even in the labor market are much less successful. I mean, actually mostly have no effect or if they have effects, uh, it's, it's extremely uh, expensive uh, uh, to get any uh, leverage there. But I think what's, it's fair to say that actually um, one specific kind of later interventions has gotten very little attention in, in research in general. Um, and that's interventions that actually, it's not schools, it's not labor market programs, but actually interventions that provide personal support from other adults. So in a sense, they're right, like go right there where this defining character, characteristic is. These children don't have the usual family support. And so the question is, can we just like use support from other adults um, to provide support that the usually disadvantaged family environments here uh, do not provide? And this is the approach that, that's followed by many mentoring programs. The, the whole idea is have an adult mentor uh, help these disadvantaged children. Um, and so question is like, if we intervene later, but like more directly towards the problem, can we get uh, real results here or is it too late? Um, and we wanted to try to address this. And as I remember like many, many years ago then, uh, I was talking with some people from these foundations that, that run or support some of these uh, mentoring programs. And they were wondering like, can we do like an ev evaluation that's really convincing? And if you think about it, if they're really successful at, at getting at these very disadvantaged kids who are usually then at age 40, 15, they are really viewed by most people around there as basket cases. Teachers usually have given up on them. And so like, how do you find a convincing control group for them? And we just, like, just told them, if you really wanna, wanna get there, you can get it in standard observational data sets. We would have to do an RCT uh, uh, to do that. And then they were totally willing to do that. And this is also something like we really like took a long while. Uh, it's a super interesting uh, experience, but it's also interesting to see that you can pull this off even in a country like Germany with very little history or experience in, in this area. So what we do want to evaluate then is whether such a uh, mentoring program uh, that's actually running nationwide in Germany, I'm going to tell you more about that in a minute, whether this program can improve the labor market prospects of disadvantaged adolescents. So it's really not just, so these are 14, 15 year olds, so they should be starting to think about uh, uh, their future and really help them to get into the labor market. Um, and not, not only we as economists should care about uh, these labor market prospects, but also I guess uh, as society, that's kind of the crucial thing on whether you can actually manage to uh, help these kids so that they can run their own life later on. So, uh, so here's the main results, just so you, you get an idea of where, where we're heading to. If we subdivide our sample uh, by the socioeconomic status of these uh, youth in like the lower half and uh, the higher half, the really low SES adolescents, so these are really, really disadvantaged. Here we find that this mentoring program uh, has very strong positive effects on the three outcome dimensions that we had uh, uh, specified beforehand and that we actually show are highly predictive of later labor market success. So these kids are still in school uh, one year after program start. Uh, so we cannot observe their labor market status yet. And it will actually be many years before we can really observe it in, in a clear way, given that there are many transitory systems afterwards. So we, we chose to look at three outcomes. Um, the first one is like a cognitive outcome, namely just the, the grades they get in math and school. The second one is like, more like a, 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 
non-cognitive outcome, behavioral outcome, namely patience and social skills, like two dimensions that have been shown to be very important for, uh, for modern labor markets. And the third one you could say is more like a, a volitional uh, component on whether they actually are oriented toward the labor market at all, or whether they have started to think about it. That's actually something that these programs or the program we are, we are studying explicitly want to, want to get at. And so we see, if you, if you look at these three, uh, three outcome dimensions, we see very strong effects for all three of them. And this combined index that takes all three of them is increased by uh, more than half a standard deviation after one year of program participation. So this is huge. It's a really big effect. It's, so it's no way that these are like kind of basket cases. You can, like this pr program shows that you can actually uh, fundamentally change their, uh, their outcomes. We do a mediation analysis and we see that actually at least some part of the treatment effect is mediated by the fact that uh, the mentoring program is uh, successful in establishing these mentors as attachment figures for the adolescents who provide guidance for the future. So it's really about this future orientation that's something that seems to be very important in this whole process. And then finally, actually, if we look at this, the higher, so it's not super high SES, but like the higher SES subgroup in our sample we literally don't find uh, any significant effect. If anything, it goes uh, in the negative direction. So it seems like with mentoring, you can really help where family background is really uh, missing, but maybe not so much where, where it's uh, not really uh, missing that much. So bottom line is that if you do this individualized adult support that substitutes family support where it is lacking, that really does help disadvantaged children, even at adolescence age. So it's not too late. It's not that you can only intervene uh, in early childhood education at age 14, 15. Um, you really can still change uh, uh, these, these kids big time. OK. Um, OK, maybe just quickly on how this relates to the literature. Uh, you will be aware of many of these. It's kind of surprising, though, that I think, and if you think about it there, we, we don't have convincing any convincing evidence on how mentoring programs for adolescents affect their, their labor market prospects. So there's a, a couple of recent papers uh, uh, that are super interesting and important, I think, that study comprehensive support programs where mentoring is one component of the treatment, but it also includes financial incentives, it in includes academic tutoring, uh, usually uh, additional educational services and like we like there's three programs that you may be may be aware of for which we've seen interesting uh, results but if you're really interested in the effect of pure mentoring this doesn't quite help because you cannot disentangle the effect of mentoring from all these other inputs so it, it may often be just the best thing to do a comprehensive support program so that's totally fine but the question is like with a more like leaner version of support in terms of just mentoring, um, uh, what are the results? In terms of evidence on these pure mentoring programs, there is a lot uh, out there, but it's really mostly non-experimental. So that's like just a list here of, of several uh, reviews. Um, so it has been reviewed uh, extensively, but, but as I indicated, I think it's very hard. Like if, if the programs are successful, like at getting at very disadvantaged youth, uh, it's very hard to find a convincing control group. And so the main exception of an experimental study in this area uh, is the, the well-known Big Brothers Big Sisters program in the US that has been evaluated with two RCTs, um, actually for the range of uh, kids aged 9 to 16, so not just adolescents, also uh, younger children. And uh, at the first um, uh, study, is already 25 years ago, uh, is more like in the setting like ours, like outside school adult mentors, and they find significant positive effects on a reduction in drug abuse and, and uh, school absenteeism. Actually, no other outcomes really. And there's a second one that's really just where we are actually run in schools and there are other high school students, somewhat older high school students who are act as mentors. So that's really already quite, quite of a kind of a different thing and they don't actually find too much uh, uh, positive effects. Um, but actually Big Brother Big Sisters is not explicitly or particularly aimed at improving labor market prospects. And I really think we, we should care about that. Uh, and the program we are studying is explicitly uh, aimed at that. And we are, uh, we are evaluating it on this uh, uh, outcome. Um, and that's kind of it. Um, there's two recent uh, super nice studies of mentoring in an elementary school context, so much younger children. Uh, 
uh, like there's one by, by uh, Fabian Kosse, um, uh, Armin Falk and co-authors uh, with, with young children uh, in, in the Cologne Bonn uh, city, um, where they find effects on pro-social reality and no actually also longer run outcomes on subsequent education, or there's another study on finding effects on truancy, but really um, uh, on adolescence, uh, uh, I'm not aware of further programs. So it's very important that we learn more about that. One study then here. Um, just to mention, there's this kind of related but distinct treatment of uh, tutoring programs. So what is tutoring? Tutoring is more like instruction of econ academic content and like also on one-to-one -one or at least small group treatments. Um, but it's really not about relationships between mentors and mentees uh, as in this case. Uh, so in that sense, uh, it's kind of like it's a related but pretty distinct uh, way of trying to help these, these kids. Actually, some have argued that part of the important effects of tutoring programs is if they are managed to set up a mentoring relationship, um, but, but uh, that, that may, may be discussed later. Okay, so let me jump into what we actually do. And so I just give you the main uh, things here in terms of results and so on. Uh, Jose has said like we, we just like recently put out a working paper version with all appendices. It's 130 pages. So anything you want to know, hopefully you can find there. So there's a lot of a uh, lot of detail uh, there, but, but I give you the main ideas here. This program is called Rock Your Life. Like even in German, it has this English name. It's kind of uh, meant to, to signal what they are about. It's, it's been founded by a group of university students uh, in 2008, since then has established more than 7,000 mentoring relationships. So it has been scaled up quite a bit as one of the biggest of these programs in Germany now. Um, and what they basically do is one-to-one -one mentoring. So each adolescent uh, that, that enters this program gets one voluntary university student as a mentor. The adolescents are on average 14 years old and um, they are in, in the lowest track schools in disadvantaged neighborhoods. So how this works is in Germany, uh, these are university students in each of these cities where, where it's running. They basically look up where's the really disadvantaged neighborhoods in our, in our city here. They go there and then we have this track German school systems with low track, medium track, high track schools or some states low track, high track schools. And so they always of course go to the very low track schools. So even in that dimension, they are already uh, disadvantaged and in, in, in the really hot spots of, of these cities. And then they talk to the schools and if they are allowed to, uh, uh, to do it, they would uh, kind of advertise uh, the program to everybody in for example, eighth or ninth grade uh, uh, in that school. And it's meant to last for one year, a mentoring relationship with like a, 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 an optional second year, which is mostly the last years in school for these children. Like given the track system, actually it used to be run to grade nine, actually no, mostly runs to grade 10. And then what you like, you, you can leave school in Germany. Um, and the most, what most uh, youth would do is actually from these schools, if they are successful, enter an apprenticeship. So that, that's what you do there. Like then you get a three year apprenticeship so that's, that's the entry card for the German labor market. So the main objective explicitly of this mentoring program is to prepare these, these youth for a successful transition into professional life. So which in this case from lower secondary schools really means either to apprenticeship or to some upper secondary school that would allow you to get some, some additional credentials. Um, but this step like to at least get an apprenticeship is a really important thing in Germany, particularly if you come from these type of schools, it's actually, um, you know, unemployment rates once you've got an apprenticeship are currently somewhere uh, around 4%, I think even below that. Um, if, you are, if you didn't uh, achieve an apprenticeship, they are close to 20%. So it's, this is a really big difference in the, in the, in the German labor market. And the idea is that, that this program supports these adolescents to develop their individual potential. So like the, focusing on the potential of each uh, youth is one of the core features of, of this program to develop their personal skills and, and also the, the school situation. And so the core of the program is just these regular one-to-one -one meetings of the mentee with his or her mentor um, meant to be every other week, more or less. Um, and the idea is that these focus on career orientation, on school assistance, uh, and also leisure activity. So um, it's not super structured. It's not that it's totally predefined what they're meant to, to be doing. These, these university students who act as mentors get some training, not super large, but like for one weekend, basically, beforehand, and some additional assistance during the program then. 
Um, and then the whole idea of the program is that you cannot like just take any treatment from the shelf here, but you actually have to start to talk with these uh, adolescents and see their world, see their problems, and then develop on uh, uh, what their perspectives may, may be what, what you're doing. So what they usually would do is maybe they, they start out like going to the uh, cinema together or to the zoo and then talk about this and that, all sorts of things. And then the mentors would start like, hey, did you actually, I would think about what you're going to do after school and and what could you uh, what could like what are what are your your wishes to do to do there and usually of course you have some ideas and then but often they, they are some sort of dreams they would say like okay i want to be a model for example like this is like something that, that people told me there and then of course they are they know that this is not realistic um uh, but then they start talking and then they realize like you yeah, okay something that's more realistic I could could be doing and I would actually have have fun to do would be to become a hairdresser. And so then the question is then the mentor says okay but what do you need to do to be a hairdresser which like you have to finish school you have to get certain degrees you have to start applying to these uh, firms uh, that, that offer the apprenticeships and so on and so they would help them with all that and discuss it with them but from the perspective of the adolescent not like telling them what to do but really trying to talk with them about what, with their potentials. Um, and so from our surveys uh, uh, that, that, that we did, what we see is like the topics that they would usually discuss in these meetings is like two thirds say it's school issues, uh, like the majority say it's leisure activities, the future in general, occupational and educational future in particular, personal issues. So it's really a broader range what they, what they would be talking about. Um, organizationally, this program is organized as a social franchise, meaning there's a centralized concept and support structure, but it's relatively lean. And then the whole program is really implemented in these self-governing locations, which are more than 40 by now. Uh, so each kind of location is, is uh, like an independently running uh, location. So what did we do to, to uh, evaluate this program, our RCT? Um, so basically we, did, uh, we, we collected data in 10 different locations, cities uh, all across Germany in seven different states of the 16 states. It was run in two cohorts. That's actually in, in, in the plan. We already figured that out that we would have to do it to get enough power. And we had a couple of uh, pilot studies actually. So overall, this, this whole uh, data collection ran from 2014 uh, until uh, last year, really, uh, all in all. And it's kind of, we wanted to be broad and not just focus on one location to make sure that we get kind of the usual location in Germany, like okay, we can generalize easily. Um, which on the one hand, I think is a very important aspect and it's important not just to like go to one location that may be running particularly well or badly and, and uh, you only learn afterwards or you actually never learn. Um, but it really also has its cost. So our experience is like doing it uh, at, a, at this broader scale, like is like organizing this, this whole RCT and, uh, uh, and going everywhere is just a big, uh, set of work so my, my team will be able to tell you how much they had to suffer <laughs> uh, uh, in between. So randomization just relied on uh, on the fact that the, the program is oversubscribed uh, at some of these sites. So we, we didn't alter any elements of the program of the recruitment anything it's just what they always did and how they think it's best to do. We didn't interfere with that at all. Um, so only if if the specific location uh, gets more applicants, more interested uh, adolescents to participate, then they have slots in terms of mentors to, to go there. We would then randomize the among the adolescents to get into the program. Then there were actually some locations where they didn't manage to, uh, uh, to be oversubscribed and we then, uh, we didn't randomize at all there. So they, um, we never prevented anybody from participating in the programs when there were open slots. So we never left, left uh, empty slots, which I think eth ethically would be somewhat uh, problematic. Um, but it's just the case that like, there are so many more youth who need help than that we can usually have slots to help them uh, that there is this oversubscription. And then we said, we told them, there was a lot of discussion with these, with these local organizations to convince them look, it's actually the fairest way that you could actually do is to, to have a lottery on who gets in and who doesn't. It's much fairer than anything else. And it was kind of interesting, like you first had to convince them, but when we then talked to the, to the adolescents, that was actually super easy. They said, yeah, of course, that's the fairest 
thing. Everybody gets the same chance to get in. And we actually know that for, you know, whenever there's like whatever, um, an exchange program with another city in the school and there are just not enough slots for, for all the applicants, what they do is like run a lottery. That's what they know from their everyday life. So they was totally fine with them. Okay, so we did a baseline survey um, before program start at any site um, in a, any cohort really, which like, so they, def and that there's a lot of variation given that these are independent sites some decide to start in October or November. There's actually a few who say, no, actually we'd rather start in, in the spring. And we would, they would just tell us when they start. And so then we would send <laughs> our project team there and do paper pencil surveys um, in the school tech context. So in these schools. Um, and then once we got the data from like from the baseline survey, we very quickly, usually within a, within a few days, a couple of days really, um, we then did random treatment assignment within each site and cohort. So first of all, thinking about this, the site-specific randomization makes sure that you've got a perfect matching of treatment and control in terms of the regional and local environments. They're just the same. And what we actually then do is a, a pairwise matching uh, design, which uh, I really, from our experience, can super uh, recommend to anybody. So this is the idea you like do this pairwise matching to get like always like have two people uh, who look, who are statistical twins, look as similar as possible. And then you just flip a coin and one of them gets in and the other one doesn't get in. Um, so this, first of all, um, ensures balancing in a much better way than a standard randomization. Uh, and it increases efficiency of your estimates quite a bit. And if you've got attrition, as you generally always have, you can actually um, then drop the other part like person from the same matched pair and your estimates will still be uh, internally valid. You can then discuss about external validity, but at least they're, they're still uh, causally identified uh, even, even with dropout. So basically you get these statistical twins and then you just have treatment assignment within uh, these two. Altogether, um, we, we had in our randomized sample, we had then at the end uh, 308 adolescents it's in 10 different cities, uh, in 19 different schools, in two cohorts. Uh, well, I'm not going to bore you with all the details of when and how we, we went where. Um, but then one year later, for each specific site and each wave, we put in a lot of effort um, to try to reach the participants one year later. Um, so both the treatment group and the control group, of course, um, which literally meant though, so that, that we had more than 100 person trips uh, to the participating schools for data collection efforts. So it, it's a major effort. But that actually, we, with that, we did reach a recontact rate of 99%, meaning there's only four of the 308 kids that we didn't get any uh, post information after one year, which I think is really pretty neat. And this has two parts. The one is our own follow up survey, it was run the same way. Uh, 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 as the baseline survey, we went to the schools again, paper and pencil uh, 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 survey there. We got uh, nearly 95% of kids this way. And then we also uh, collected administrative data, namely of, on the math grades from the schools. So this is not self-reported. This is actually the, the administrative data in the schools. They have it in their archives. In Germany, you have to apply for that uh, with each of the state governments really. So we had to do it seven times for the different states. Actually, you know, one state is different. Usually like this 50 page uh, data security type of uh, application that was successful. And with that, we couldn't then could then actually get the administrative uh, data from the schools. Still a lot of effort to go there. But so we got that information for more than 95% of kids. Okay. And now, I mean, just to, to give you an idea in terms of the balancing of, of the sample. Um, so we do this, this matching uh, for, for the randomization, which is, uh, and, and then uh, you use some of this information to, to do the pre-balancing really. Uh, this is like students' gender, age, migration background, the number of books at home, their grades in school and so on. Um, and of course here we are super nicely balanced, but that's nearly by construction. But then if you can, like there's other, like big five control variables, for example, that we didn't consider there and they are super nicely balanced and we have really for all our outcome variables that we're gonna use, I'm gonna talk about them in a minute. We have baseline information before treatment and we are really both on the index that we're gonna construct and on all the, the components of this index, we are super nicely balanced. So that, that looks good. Okay, so what is uh, 
the outcome that we are interested in. So we, we call it labor market prospects. Of course, at the end of the day, we want to know how they're going to how they're doing in the labor market. As indicated, we're not going to know that for several uh, for several years, if at all ever. And so we pre pre-specified three sets of outcome dimensions that are actually highly predictive of, of adolescents' later labor market success. And like we have a long chapter in, in the appendix it's kind of a paper in itself that uses the German PIAC data and shows that actually all of these three uh, components are uh, highly predictive of, uh, of uh, labor market outcomes. So the first component is this comp cognitive component is literally just the math grade that they get in school. This is administrative data so we don't ask the kids it's actually this is the, the real data. Uh, German grades run from one to six, where one is the best and six the worst, but actually we took, take it in reverse order. We standardize everything or any treatment effects I'm going to show you today. They're all standardized with higher values being better. Um, the second component is, is this behavioral component. Uh, it has actually two sub uh, components. The one is patience, just in terms of the future orientation of children. These are three survey items. Actually, we, we didn't make up any of these items. It's really, we take them from from existing surveys, either psychometric surveys or like the German socioeconomic panel, the SUP, uh, so well-established scales. The social skills index is really itself uh, a component, has three subcomponents. One is pro-sociality, so really other regarding behavior as in, in the strength and difficulties questionnaire. Uh, then it's trust, which is general trust in others, and actually self-efficacy, meaning trust in their own skills and abilities. So we put all these into one uh, index. And the third component is like this volitional component that actually the, the, the program runners kind of told us is part of what they think is really important, namely whether these youth start to think about the future and have some uh, orientation towards the labor market. And this really includes two components. The one is whether we ask them what they uh, want to do after school. And, and if they say they want to do an apprenticeship, we take this as, uh, uh, as a labor market orientation. And the second one is, whether they know exactly which occupation they want to work on later in life. Um, so to, to start with, we're going to actually combine all these three components into one index of labor market prospects. It's just going to be an equally weighted average of the Z scores of the components. And this is really just to capture the overall program effect, but also to alleviate any concerns that you may have with, with multiple hypothesis testing. So we take all the outcomes, put them into one index. Uh, you can do it then. I'm also going to show you um, results for the three components uh, in even the subcomponents. Um, and you can do multiple hypothesis testing also in the appendix showing that there is actually significant effects even after uh, multiple hypothesis testing correction for each of the three components. Okay, final thing before I, I show you the results um, is um, the socioeconomic status of, or, or background of, of, of the children. So the programs explicitly targeted at a very low socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, and that's actually all like we, we all expected and wanted to evaluate it on. Um, basically what we learned from our um, uh, baseline questionnaires after, after a while is that actually, despite this focus, actually there's also so, like quite a number of, of kids in the, in the treatment or treatment and control that are, that you wouldn't really ter term low uh, SES. They had somewhat higher SES. And here, the like conceptually, it's not quite clear what to expect. Expect first of all, probably the lack of family support is just not as severe for these kids. And you could even think about crowd out effects of other useful inputs for these kids. So if like if you meet with this mentor every other week, uh, and if this crowds out some activity that otherwise would be very conducive to your development, you may even get get negative effects. So we didn't have clear. Uh, hypotheses for the higher SES kids. So, and therefore we want to subdivide uh, the sample and we do it by a very simple measure. Uh, one of the, like my most beloved SES measure really. And it's just based on the number of books at home. You have this questionnaire item and, and many of these surveys where they just ask how many books do you have at home? And it's basically how we're going to define low ES here is kids who are in the lowest two of the six categories of this book at home variable, meaning they have less than, uh, less or equal than 25 books uh, in their home. In our case, that's 47% of the sample. This is what we call low SES and the other 53%, so nearly half and half, um, are what we call higher SES. So it's not really high SES, it's like, but it's, it has a full, full range. And we actually, in, in 
separate analysis, we're going to show that if you subdivide the higher SES group into two groups, uh, results don't differ there. So here's kind of nearly 50-50. If you look at the same measure, for example, in the German PISA data, um, the low SES would actually only be 23% of the population. So the mentoring program does manage to get close like uh, to, to reach really disadvantaged kids. So basically, in that sense, the median kid in our low SES subsample is somewhere at the 11th percentile of the, of the population. So that's pretty good, actually. But also there's other in there. And this, I think it's mainly because they target these schools, but then don't do any sp additional targeting within the school. So any kid within the school who wants to participate can participate. And so you also get these higher SES kids in there. Again, in the appendix, we show uh, like you can do a broader SES index, not just based on books, but also considering parental education, parental employment status, and you get very similar results. Is actually, I have got much preference for, for this one, not least, for example, because you've got a lot of missing values in the other things. So these kids often don't know uh, the, the parental education very well. And we've got more than half of the kids have a migration background. So the parents will have gotten their education in very different countries. I don't think this is very informative, actually. Okay. Here's the, the main results. Uh, let's start out with one uh, simple picture, just parametrically. Um, so by construction uh, with the, the, the Z scores, um, the index of all labor market prospects, so these three components that go in there, is, uh, is scaled to be zero in the control group. Um, and so in the full sample, we see a positive treatment effect of some 15 percentage point uh, for 15 percent uh, on this of a standard deviation on this index, uh, that's that's marginally significant. But this really um, hides big time heterogeneity. So here's the low SES subsample. So the half of the kids that are really disadvantaged. You can see that like yeah, they are disadvantaged also in terms of this this uh, labor market prospects. Uh, they're like in the country the control group is like a quarter of a standard deviation below uh, the mean here. And so we see this huge treatment effect of more than half a standard deviation, uh, statistically highly significant and like and quantitatively just huge for these kids. So they really improve big time. And by contrast, in this higher SES subsample, um, they start off being much better. And if anything, uh, their measures of labor market prospects are reduced. And that's the basic pattern we see all the time, like a strong significant effect for the low SES half and a negative treatment effect uh, that's smaller, but not super small, actually, mostly, uh, but never statistically significant uh, in the higher SES sample. And that's, I'm going to show you many details now, but that's kind of the big feature we see everywhere. First of all, maybe then before I get back to like, we mostly run parametric results, but here's, here's the, the, the non parametric result, which I think gives the whole story very clearly. So the, the top three charts are the baseline survey. So before, uh, treatment before uh, assignment to treatment and control group. Uh, the bottom three are one year later, like one year in the program. Here's the full sample to the left. Uh, you see it's very nicely balanced um, in terms of these labor market prospect index. And so is the low SES subsample nicely balanced and the high SES subsample. Now, one year after treatment, you see a treatment effect. So the solid line uh, is, is the treatment group, the dashed line. Uh, it's a control group. So it's somewhat shifted to the right and, and the usual Kolmogorov Smirnov uh, tests of, of these distributions gives you the same result as a parametric one, like meaning like a marginally significant treatment effect. But then you really see like here's so this boom, big time shift to the right in the low SES group. So the whole distribution is shifted. It's not something specific. It's really everybody like shifts to the right. And then there's really nothing going on in the higher SES sample, as you can see here. And so this this negative thing that's going on is actually not in the main part of the distribution. It's somewhere to the left here, there's something going on, whatever that is. I'm not quite sure. But overall, there's really a zero effect. So this is the main effect. OK, let's let's get back to the parametric uh, version and show you some, some of the coefficient estimates. So the first column, we just do the simple thing, like regressing the labor uh, market outcome index on a treatment indicator, a higher SES indicator, and their interaction. Just simple as that. No, nothing else in the model. So here you can basically see that the the, the outcome difference in the um, in the control group uh, is 0.48 of a standard deviation. So yes, so this is kind of the SES gap that we see uh, without uh, intervention. 
And then we have the treatment effect in the, in the low SES uh, group, which is 0.55 of a standard deviation. So it's huge, it's statistically highly significant. You can do randomization inference, uh, so super highly uh, significant. And we see the strong negative significant interaction between treatment and higher SES, meaning like at the bottom here, you can see the treatment effect for the high SES is just like the first uh, coefficient minus uh, or plus the second uh, coefficient. And you get this negative treatment effect of 0.2 standard deviation. So it's not even small really, um, but it's, uh, it doesn't reach significance. And that, that's going to be the same results everywhere. Now, this is this super simple model, nothing else in there. Um, now uh, we can do additional things. And if, it's, uh, if the RCT was nicely done, it shouldn't affect our treatment effects. And that's what you see here. But just to show you stuff we can do here. So we observe the outcome variable before treatment. So we can condition on, uh, uh, on pre-treatment outcome variables. You can see a very strong uh, effect here. The R squared here goes from 0.04 to 0.33. So it's really very meaningful control. Doesn't affect the treatment effect at all. Of course, shouldn't because treatment is uh, like orthogonal, uh, but, but here's that what we see. And you can put in these randomization pair fixed effects. So remember, we do this pairwise randomization. So we first create these statistical twins, and then one of them gets into the program, the other one doesn't. Now we can put in 150 fixed effects here, really. And these, like these, boost the, the R squared to 0.7. This is the whole meaning of it. Like you get statistical twins, they are similar. Now you dummy that out, but treatment effect is just the same. Like really doesn't affect it here. And you can condition on the additional covariates, um, not, no effect, of course. It's actually, so these are all intention to treat effects. So you just like treatment is whether you got offered a, a, a place in the program. Of course, you never get full uh, enrollment. You never get full program take up. If we define, take up pretty broadly, meaning that we know that the mentors and mentees have had met at least once, um, we get a program take up of 0.86. So basically 16% of the kids who were offered never started at all in the program. And that's actually more dropout later on is less easy to define. So it's actually, um, so the treatment on the fully treated for one year, maybe even larger, but here like the treatment on the treated is just like, the ITT times the uh, inverse of the uh, of the take up rate, so that's two thirds of a standard deviation. Okay, that was the this this overall index. Now we can actually look at each of the three components. So to convince you that it's not very specific here or there, it's kind of uh, amazing that we see treatment effect in all three dimensions here, and they are very similar. So here's the math grade, the simplest one, just standardized um, treatment effect of 0.29 percent of a standard deviation, uh, significant. And what you can then look at is the whole distribution here. So these, these grades in Germany are range from very good to good, satisfied, and pass. And you basically see treatment effects across the whole distribution, even of these, of these, of, of the, these grade outcomes. Um, the second uh, component is these patients and social skills. Um, treatment effect of 0.44, so even larger. Um, and that's a combination of like, like a very strong effect on patients and somewhat smaller and not statistically significant effect on social skills. So it's still there, but it's, uh, it's, it's marginal in terms of significance. Uh, it doesn't reach uh, uh, standard levels. And you can see the same actually for each of the three components, you have pro sociality, for trust, for self-efficacy. It's positive here. It's, it's kind of negative down here for the high SES. The same was there for grades if you, if you looked at it. Uh, so it's the same pattern, but but not as strong, not as not as large an effect on these social skills. And the third component is this labor market orientation. We see 0.29% uh, of a standard deviation increase, marginally significant, but it's really driven by this one component where we ask them, what do you want to do after school? Uh, and there we see a, a strongly significant uh, treatment effect that kids say, I want to do an apprenticeship. So they are more focused, have an idea of what they want to do. They don't know more about what exactly they're going to work in, in the future. And that may actually just be uh, much too early. But if you, if you look at the raw data here, in the control group, 44% of the kids say they want to do an apprenticeship after school. And the treatment group is 66%. So like you increase that by, by half uh, the amount, like 22 percentage points of the kids are now induced. So they, from rather saying they don't quite know what to do or have some some strange ideas, they, they have this focus. 
All right, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, uh, at the clock. I maybe have five minutes left. Um, so let me not bore you with any details on additional heterogeneity. There's actually not too much. We don't see any heterogeneity by gender. You see significant positive treatment effects for low SES boys as much as for low SES girls, for example, and nothing for the high SES ones um, uh, and uh, robustness. But let me uh, uh, take a couple of minutes to talk about the mediation analysis. So we, we try to understand what's going on in there to, to some extent. And so we just follow the, the, the Heckman and Pinto type of mediation analysis, uh, which is kind of straightforward really. So we can look at and causally identify treatment effects of the program on any of the mediators that we come up with. But then actually like the second step for the second step, uh, you don't have uh, like how the mediators are related to outcomes. There's actually no causal identification of that. And this really depends on the classical assumptions that mediators are orthogonal to left out mediators in this, in this second uh, step regression. So in that sense, it's actually um, more like a descriptive analysis and I want you to, to interpret it that way, but I think it's actually quite meaningful and interesting. So what did we look at for like, let's first look at the low ACS subsample where we find the strong positive treatment effect. So we were looking at mediators that really are aspects of this relationship between mentors and mentees that may facilitate the transition into professional life. And so we kind of have three uh, variables here that actually do capture the three, the aspects of the three components that we're looking at really. The first one is that, uh, that the adolescents say that they perceive school as something that's useful for the future job. The second one is that uh, the adolescents say that they talk with a mentor about their future. And the third one is that they, like on a battery of questions where they say like, where do you get information for future job choice from? Um, and you can like, point out your parents and so on and so forth. And one is, is a mentor and, and this is whether the mentor is actually important for the job choice. And so if we just focus on the bottom uh, uh, one here where like we put in all three of these uh, mediators together, it's actually like two thirds of the total treatment effect remains unexplained by, by the, the observed mediators that we put in here. So it's not that we explain everything would, would be funny with these kind of uh, proxies for, for different uh, channels, but at least one third of the total treatment effect is actually mediated in this way. Uh, 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 and so meaning like we do see significant treatment effects of the program on all three of these channels and all three are positively correlated uh, with, with the, the labor market outcomes. And it's really the, uh, the second uh, component here uh, that drives much of this uh, um, uh, mediation. So meaning the program is successful if and when it is uh, it manages to uh, uh, to set up the mentors as somebody to which these uh, to whom these uh, adolescents can talk about the future. If the program is successful, if the adolescents say yes, I talk to uh, I, I feel the mentor is somebody I can talk to about my future, then you see these pro positive treatment effects. So this future orientation seems to be very important. Let me skip the details, maybe also skip the details for the higher SES sample so we have time for some questions. Uh, we did a little bit stuff there that's also interesting. Um, another aspect for to, to think about the mechanisms is that uh, something we can only do for the treatment group. So for the treatment group, so those who were actually having a, a mentoring relationship, we actually asked them in our background questionnaires about different aspects of their mentoring relationships. Um, but no comparing between low SES adolescents who are treated and higher SES adolescents gives you some indication as well of what may be important just because you find this strong treatment effect for the low SES kids and nothing for the high SES kids, if at all negative. And, and we see actually two qualitative factors where we see a big difference uh, in the likelihood that uh, they're treated uh, low SES kids say this is relevant compared to higher SES. And the one is, that the mentee says he's better at school because of the mentor. That's basically 40% of the higher SES participants say so, but 28% of the low SES. So that's highly significant. And the second one is that the mentor, that the adolescents say the mentor helped to solve non-school related problems, a similar difference here. So this is really about qualitative things where we can basically see that the mentor helped in school and out, out of school. And then for many other things, we actually don't see much of a difference really, and particularly not at all in terms of the, how often they meet, how long they meet, 
or even the topics they discuss in, in these meetings. We just don't see any difference between high and low ACS kids. There's one uh, single uh, uh, exception here, and that's this one, that uh, that they the adolescents say they talk about leisure activities. So that's much more likely in the higher SES group than in the low SES group. So 67% versus 46%. And that's kind of interesting, I think, because so what may be happening is that with these higher SES adolescents, they start to talk with these uh, university students about leisure and stuff and so on, but that ultimately doesn't help them at all uh, for their labor market prospects. And that may be part of, of, of what's going on there. So the main takeaway here is mentoring is successful apparently only if the adolescents really lack adult support uh, and if it successfully uh, establishes uh, an additional attachment figure, the, the mentor with whom uh, uh, the adolescents can talk about their future, and it's more qualitative factors of the relationships that matter rather than mere program intensity. Okay, we talked about the literature in the start, so uh, just wrapping up. Uh, I think the bottom line is that these labor market prospects of these highly disadvantaged adolescents are malleable. And for the low ACS adolescents, we see that this mentoring program really has a big boost in terms of labor market prospects in all three dimensions. Um, so, so it seems to be the case that mentors can substitute for some of the elements uh, that of, of parental support that many disadvantaged youth don't get usually. And we don't see any effects uh, for the higher SES adolescents, if anything, an indication towards the negative. So lack of adult support doesn't seem to be a major handicap for these higher SES adolescents. And uh, so mentoring may not be the best intervention here. You can do a simple cost benefit uh, analysis. Of course, lots of hand waving back of the envelope. We, we observe the costs from the program that's straightforward. It's not very expensive really. Um, uh, we, we try to uh, project the benefits by just looking at uh, like, to what extent these better school grades that we see are correlated with later lifetime labor market returns. And if you just take these point estimates, you actually get a, a benefit cost ratio of 15 to one for the program as is. And if you would focus it just on the low SES kids where you actually find uh, the strong treatment effects, it would actually be a 31 to one uh, benefit cost ratio. So this, this easily pays for itself uh, if, uh, if implemented. Final thought then is, about the successful scalability of, of uh, mentoring programs. And so, of course, whenever you run this RCT, that's a big, big question. So first thing, of course, is there's this strong heterogeneity by SES. So I think it's uh, the one thing for scalability is that it's important to target those who lack family support. Then you get going to get treatment effects. And the second aspect here is actually, well, the whole program is a franchise that grew from just one location to 40 sites pretty quickly in Germany. So it was scalable. And our RCT was not focused on one selected or two selected sites, we're like we had 10 different sites here. So in that sense, it seems to be uh, scalable beyond one specific location. Maybe the one uh, thing to note though is that so far all these cities are uh, restricted to, to university towns because this is where, where the students are, where the university students. And so we cannot speak towards generalizability to more rural areas, I think. Okay, that's it. Thanks so much for uh, uh, attending and listening. I'm looking forward to some discussion. Okay, thank you so much for your brilliant uh, presentation uh, and to let us know about this uh, ambitious program and all the analysis that you have uh, conducted, secondary analysis. I didn't remember that the paper was so long. Actually, I read it, but I didn't remember it was <laughs> so many pages. So people can, can find more results, even more results in, in the paper, in the working paper. So here, I think we have some some messages here or some, some questions. And yeah, I have questions from Stan Siebert who asked uh, if you, do you know evidence of uh, mentoring with other educational programs uh, like tutoring or class rise, uh, sorry, class uh, size reduction? And also uh, a second question from, from him is, in base of your knowledge about this topic, what kind of tutoring, mentoring could be more effective in terms of labor market prospect? One-on-one, uh, -on -one, uh, teacher, student, or by peers on, in some subjects? That's the first question. First question. Um, so I, I'm not quite sure. I, 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 let, let, let's start with the second one. I'm not quite sure I fully got the, the first one. Um, so um, of course, this is like a specific program and we cannot within the program identify whether it would be better to have university students as mentors or whatever, older people as mentors. 
Um, and there are like arguments in favor or against uh, like specific groups of mentors. But I think what is relevant to see here is that it is, first of all, it's one-to-one. -one, and I do think this is a very crucial element here because you need to establish this personal relationship and these mentors like first have to like start to talk with these kids and get to know their world and then uh, start to think from their perspective and think about what what is it that really uh, is missing for these kids? And I think that's something you cannot establish like in the classroom. It's not teachers who can do that. It's actually, so, you know, I guess most of these adolescents, they hate school. So the last thing they want is get more schooling or something. And so I find it really interesting. So if you just get a, a university student, so somebody somewhat older who actually knows a bit more of the world who starts to like build a relationship with you that this can actually make quite a difference. And I do think this is part of the thing. And it's also part of the thing that it's not fully structured in the sense that he is this and this, and this is what the mentor has to do. It's more like start to like get into the world of this kid and, and take it from there and don't tell them what, what they should be doing, but kind of listen to them, what they are thinking of, and then help them think about a more realistic uh, uh, orientation and think about their future. I think that that is part of, of the deal here. And so, and that's nothing you can achieve with like in a classroom context in the same way. And it's nothing you can achieve in, in, in other ways, I guess. Maybe you can repeat the first question. I, I think I just didn't get it fully. Oh, yes. The, yeah, the question was about the, uh, sorry, uh, about evidence about other, other different programs. All right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, well, well, <laughs> the, the question. Yeah. I think everybody has the same idea there. So, my view is that, like, class size reductions for these kids don't have much effect. So, you may hope that it's got small effects on on their test score achievement. I even doubt that. Um, uh, and in these uh, uh, settings, more generally, just we know that, in my view, uh, evidence that that just reducing class sizes or adding more resources to schools um, has usually limited effects at least it's very hard to get real effects and the same is like true for labor market programs for example if you like set in somewhat later i mean if you get to these really low skilled people I and mean, most of the labor market programs that have been tried have close to zero or sometimes even negative effects um, and that's kind of the, the whole motivation to think about what else can can you do uh, to reach these these adolescents Okay, thank you. So there's another question from Mohamed uh, Besal. Uh, he says that the, uh, the fact that the control group is the applicants that did not receive uh, mentoring and they know it, uh, it can uh, may, maybe uh, might disappoint them and cause some problems for causal inference. What, what's your opinion about this? Yeah, that's a good, good point. We actually did think quite a bit about that to begin with. Um, and actually, I, I think by now that this is really in, in the setting and non-issue. So what we did is actually to make sure that they are not totally disappointed, uh, they, they got a, a small alternative treatment, which was usually like either a ticket for a cinema, for example, or in some so lo locations actually could decide on it themselves because they're so autonomous. Some would offer them actually to participate in a weekend course where they would visit a firm or something. Um, and what we heard is that take up of these things was very low. Um, so it seems that most of these, these kids have, have forgotten it uh, very quickly, but in principle, of course, it, is, uh, it could be a concern that we, that we could think of. Um, and there's like limited things what you, what you can ultimately do about it from the background questionnaires and the stuff we have, there's really no indication whatsoever that that's, in, that that's the case. Oh, here we have another question from Alvaro Choi from the University of Barcelona. Well, he congratulates you for your excellent presentation. And he said, he asked about uh, if you can uh, please uh, stand a bit on, on the profile of the of the mentors, uh, how they were assigned across the schools in terms of All right. displaying something, but I think it's, it's interesting yeah. to oh, no, that's, at oh, the that's least. Very interesting support. And that's actually one of the things <coughs> we hope to do a bit more research on. There. So, okay, the way it works is like, um, it's just these, they are voluntary uh, mentors and then just this, this mentoring site goes to one or two, like usually two schools in this town and then they just like take it up there. So there's really not much assignment there. It's just like uh, they go there. Um, then the big, and the way that the mentors are then matched to the mentees 
in most locations is just like they have a first meeting and um, and there's something called speed dating where they just everybody gets to know everybody else and then they quickly just uh, meet each other and somehow get a match. Um, mm -hmm. It's kind of interesting because they, they think that's actually an interesting and important feature. And we initially thought about maybe we could actually randomize that as well and say like, see whether that's important uh, and have like another type of assignment uh, randomly in some other locations. I'm glad we didn't pursue that because we would never have had the power to uh, find any effect there. But so we cannot talk about it. That's kind of the program that we have with this mostly speed dating type of matching. And whether that's important or not is something that, that would be important for future research. If we look at the, the mentors, well, we know they come, for example, from all sorts of different subjects at university. It's not that it's just whatever uh, pedagogical people or something. Um, and we only for a subset of um, mentors, we actually have um, a, a survey of the mentors. And we actually haven't matched that yet because there were some data restrictions for a while to our sample yet. And I fear it's probably going to be too small samples to do much, but at least descriptively, we, we should actually be able to say a bit more about some of these aspects uh, in the future, I hope. But it may, be, may have limits. But I think, I mean, saying that, it's like you see that I do think this would be an important topic for future, future research, and we don't have the answers. Mm -hmm. OK, here we have another question from Fabian Kenner. Uh, can you say something about the uh, low uh, SES uh, adolescents who didn't sign up for the program? Do you have any information? Or... Well, no. <laughs> and no, that's, I guess, that's, I guess that's, 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 a, that's another very important and, and good point. So what we can estimate is treatment effects for people who were willing to participate in the program. So yeah. they had to, they didn't have to apply for it, but they actually had to express their interest. So they didn't have to start themselves. These, these programs go to that school and then they talk to all the eighth graders in the, in the school and tell them, here's the school program, do you want to participate? Mm -hmm. But those who never say they want to participate, are of course, not part of this year. And of course, we had to get got consent for them and from their parents to be part of the, uh, of the analysis. So this is all, uh, of course, like these are the lessons, so you better get that. And so, people who are like kids who are really not at all motivated, interested, and don't say they want to participate, we cannot tell anything about potential treatment effects for them, and they may be smaller for them. Um, so all we can say is there's a lot of really disadvantaged kids who are who were willing to participate here, um, but we cannot extrapolate to, to those who didn't apply. Yeah, I think I have one, one final questions from uh, Dara Flannery. Uh, well, he thanks you uh, for the great talk. And uh, if you have, uh, he asked about if you have information on the gender of the mentors and their specific uh, mentees, and if so, uh, could there for their heterogeneity in the feds? Right, right. No, good point. Um, that's actually so. The way it works in nearly all of the settings is that you always get um, a same-sex mentor. So what's, it's never allowed for a female adolescence to have a male mentor, maybe for obvious reasons. Um, and so basically it's not identified. I mean, if, if, you're, if you're a girl, you're gonna have a female mentor, full stop. Um, mm -hmm. There are some variation among, uh, for, for the boys, but that's also not gonna be uh, really exogenous because it's a locational choice. So there's, um, that, that's something we, we cannot identify here. Um, and maybe more generally, like things like, would, Things that would be interesting is, for example, to see whether the mentors have a, have a migration background themselves and whether matching there is important or not. This wasn't randomized, so we, we couldn't uh, causally identify it, but maybe with the information on the mentors, we can at least descriptively look at that a bit in the future. Okay, thank you for the clarification. I think we have, we have any other like question. To... Sorry? I would like to, to ask. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah of course. <laughs> using my phone so that I can. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, uh, first of all, I would like to say that it's it's a brilliant presentation and so I would like to congratulate you. But, um, and also to say that um, for me, these are great news uh, to see that uh, teenagers with low SES uh, have opportunities uh, to, to change. <laughs> um, so uh, maybe the sample is not so big, but the results are very positive. So, so that's, that's great. Um, then I have a question. I think most of the questions were related to tutors. 
because um, uh, you can see that um, these tutors were university students. Uh, but, and you say that from different areas, uh, very same mixed, uh, but uh, did they receive any kind of, uh, of training uh, before doing uh, this mentoring? Uh, how were they selected? Were they just one type of person that likes to work with others or, and maybe these influences? So there has to be maybe for future research, some kind of control because maybe the, uh, the, the way these tutors are affects the results. And so it would be fantastic to know which type of tutors we need to get better results. Absolutely, yeah, so I couldn't agree more. Like, first of all, thanks and thanks to everybody else for, for, the, for the kind words. And I, I also th think this is super encouraging results because what you, I mean, literally is some of these stories like on the ground, like my team has been in all these locations and talked to stuff there. And they say like sometimes there are some teachers who are super engaged and 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 but they are very happy to get the support from from mentors even though they usually don't know who who has a mentor. Um, but but they they also say there's other things where like areas you you get these examples where it's just clear that everybody has given up on these adolescents because they are just basket cases they've tried so long and didn't, nothing worked because they just don't like school and and so I think this result shows it's actually they are not basket cases it's actually not lost cases you can do a lot there if you if you approach it differently now about uh, the mentors like it's a super important question so is these mentors just volunteer in their unit so basically this rock your life group in the in the university would like advertise it and say here we want to like who's interested in being a mentor and they just volunteer they have to set up this like legal there's a legal requirement and or not a requirement but a legal document in germany where you can prove that you like have never been convicted and stuff like that so they have to prove that otherwise they couldn't be and there are some personal interviews and there if the local organizing uh, group thinks they they wouldn't fit as mentor they wouldn't be let in but that's kind of uh, and then there's a training they actually have three trainings uh, along the way there's first like one week and training so not long training but how they, well, that's mainly about how they try to approach these kids from these very different uh, backgrounds. And I, like, I've, I've heard that this can be very important for them to start thinking about it. But then they've got a lot of leeway, but they can always ask some people uh, in the organization if they've got problems and so on. Um, and, and then the big question, of course, is like, which, one, which ones would be the best mentors? I think that that's a super interesting uh, and important question. There's this additional question, like some people would argue well, if you want to improve the labor market outcome, why do you use university students? Why don't you use people who really have a job, who know the transition, who know the real world, who can provide networks to, to get into real jobs? Um, that like, this is the one hand of the argument, which I can see. Um, if you talk about, like I, I did talk about to, to the people who organize this, this Rock Your Life thing. And if you talk about to them, they say, um, uh, uh, no, uh, what they, they are really convinced that uh, having these university students is exactly the right thing. These are pretty young people. They are not so different, like so far away from, from these adolescents. They are motivated, but they actually, they have seen a bit more of the world. They like went to university, have a bit broader perspective and are therefore able to take the perspective of the kids. Um, and they're much closer there. And therefore they can actually talk to them about the future and can sometimes, not always, but sometimes also be role models. So it's an open question. I'm just putting up these two arguments here. Uh, and I think it would be great to learn more about, about that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. I think we are uh, a bit late. So I think no question, no more questions. So thank you again for, for your presentation and for engagement during this time. and and. You can stay a little moment if we can discuss another things, but so we can finish the, the session. So uh, remember that uh, we will continue with the, the sessions, parallel sessions in the afternoon, uh, beginning at, at 3 p.m. Okay. So thank you for coming to, to all attendees. Thanks so much for having me. Great thing. Thank you.